Cast your minds back to September the 24th, 2002. The then Prime Minister Tony Blair stands in the chamber of the House of Commons to address Parliament. Speaking about Saddam Hussein, he says, His WMD programme is active, deep and growing. Saddam has continued to produce them. He has existing and active military plans for the use of chemical and biological weapons, which could be activated within 45 minutes. Over the next few months, however, Saddam's forces did not use any of these devastating weapons against the Western forces. The search for them after Saddam was toppled from power revealed nothing. Following these revelations, Tony Blair made another speech in the House of Commons, in which he said, There are literally thousands of sites, but it is only now that the Iraq survey group has been put together. A dedicated team of people, which includes former UN inspectors, scientists and experts, they will be able to go in and do the job properly. I have no doubt they will find the clearest possible... How am I spending like Winston Churchill? <laughs> I have no doubt... I would like it as well, thank you. I have no doubt they will find the clearest possible evidence of Saddam's weapons of mass destruction. <coughs> For the Prime Minister, the fact that they would not been found was not the issue. The issue was the fact that the people had simply not been looking hard enough. The fact gave him the opportunity to reaffirm his original statement. Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Twelve months later, the Iraqi survey group failed to find any weapons of mass destruction. But Blair spoke with the House of Commons Liaison Committee on the subject of the war. What Blair said was very interesting. I have to accept that we haven't found them. And we may never find them. We don't know what's happened to them. They could have been removed. They could have been hidden. They could have been destroyed. These words were very telling. Let's follow it through. They were there. We went to war because they were there. The troops on the ground didn't do their jobs well enough. So we assembled a team of experts to go and help them and look for them. The experts didn't find them either. They must have been hidden. But they were definitely there. In a speech to the Labour Party conference later that year, Blair was forced to accept that Saddam Hussein did not have chemical or biological weapons. He immediately argued, however, that the decision to go to war was right anyway. The problem is, he said, I can apologise for the information that turned out to be wrong, but I can't, sincerely at least, apologise for removing Saddam. The world is a better place with Saddam in prison. His stance continued for at least the next 10 years in interviews and reports, investigations. He struggled to remember the chronology of the events and speeches he made, and he was obviously under pressure whenever he was questioned about it. In 2014, when the so-called Islamic State began an offensive in Iraq, Blair came up with one more justification for his decision to back the war in Iraq in 2003. In this justification, he outlined the fact that the UK did not intervene in the crisis that occurred in Syria in 2011, which led to a bitter civil war there. On his website, he has a website, <laughs> who knew? He wrote, in Syria, we called for the regime to change. We took no action, and it is in a worse state now than it's ever been. In other words, what would it be like now if we hadn't? In other words, on Iraq, I was right. So look at that again. The troops didn't have enough time to find the weapons. They weren't looking hard enough. The inspectors weren't looking in the right areas. They'd been dismantled or destroyed. No, 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 no. The missile fairies have taken them. They've run off with them. They've spirited them away. The fact is that he had provided Parliament with the wrong information. Whether or not he knew it was wrong is largely unimportant. Members of Parliament made their decision on the information that was provided to them. Evidence. When the evidence began to change, when the information in the reports 
from the experts suggested that there were no WMD, Blair was firmly stuck in a rut from which he was unwilling or unable to escape. He was not open to changing course. He was not open for discussion. And as the evidence grew against WMD, it became more about saving face than saving lives. More about his personal popularity than doing the right thing. He was so entrenched in his original argument that he was completely blinkered to the mountain evidence against his original statements. Excuse me, but is this your opinion? Or where is, where is this coming from? Because this is an opinion. Yes. No, hang on. Hang on. Because I'm, I'm losing the will to live with this. <laughs> okay. Where is it going? <laughs> You'll find out in a second. What he then began to do was use statistics to justify his argument. But he ignored every statistic that simply didn't fit his cause. He used wider humanitarian arguments but failed to see the other human costs. He became so entrenched in one aspect, he discarded all other evidence to the contrary. This is called cognitive dissonance. It's the state of having an inconsistent thought, belief or attitude, especially relating to behavioural decisions or attitude change. In the recent game when I was AR, the away team pulled back to a half, from a half-time deficit of 17 points to be within one score of the home side with 20 minutes left. They were by far the stronger of the two teams in the second half. The home team received two yellow cards for repeat offences. The referee followed the correct pattern, penalty, penalty, warning, yellow card, and another for a deliberate charge in the chasing player denying the ball. With less than 10 minutes to go, and the away side having dropped the ball over the line, and having two other chances held up, there was a scrum on the five metre. The away side drove straight and the defending tight head folded. My call, which the referee took and penalised. Scrum option was taken. This time the loose head on the referee side lost his shape on the drive and folded in. Penalty. Less than 60 seconds later, after a couple of phases of play, there was another attacking five metre scrum for a ball that was held up in goal. This time the defending loose head stands up. The referee resets the scrum. They lose the scrum and the ball is cleared away. The final six minutes of the game saw the home side defending their own line with some great consistency. And only a very good turnover when an attacker was left unsupported and ended the game with that seven point difference still intact. During the debrief with the performance reviewer, the referee was asked about the sequence of scrums, in particular the third one, which was reset. He was asked, what was your reason for resetting the scrum? This is how the conversation went. The loose head stood up. Was there any go forward? No, they just stood up. Are you sure? Well, there wasn't much movement forward. So did they go forward? Not enough. Not enough for what? To do anything else? What else could you have done? Well, I can't go under the sticks. Why not? We've been told that if a front row player stands up and the scrum has ended, we can't go under the post. It's a player safety issue. So what else might you have done? I can't go under the sticks. The scrum's ended for player safety. Was there any movement before he stood up? Not enough. What do you mean by not enough? Silence. If they had put a shove on, and driven them over the line to score a try, would anybody have had anything to say from the home team? No. So what do you think the attacking team wanted to do? Drive the scrum. Why couldn't they? The loose head stood up. So? Well, I can't go under the sticks. I have to be set for safety. I don't agree with it. It's what we're being told. Told by whom? Well, my coach. Name blanked out. We keep going around in circles, so I offer the question at this point, what about the pattern of play? Two dominant scrums both ended illegally and both penalised. On the next scrum, <coughs> they go again, and you reset it. Well, we're being told to take each scrum individually. What do you mean? We have to look as, it's, uh, as a standalone event. We can't take other events into consideration. So, by that reasoning, all of you yellow cards were wrong because they were based on repeat team offences. Penalty, penalty, warning, yellow card. Do you see what I mean? Well, there wasn't enough movement forward. The performance reviewer, with a little chuckle, says, but they have got the shove on. The questioning by the performance reviewer was to examine what he could have done differently. But the referee, 
as with Tony Blair in this situation, was blinded by an acute need to defend, at all costs, the decision that he had made on the field. The home team actually stated after the game that they expected the yellow card on that scrum because their prop stood up under pressure. It was the third scrum offence in a row on the five metre line. <coughs> They'd have been quite happy if the referee had awarded the penalty try as well. This is where the performance review was hoping the referee would end up. As it was, he was suffering from a severe and potential incurable case of cognitive dissonance. He continued, what else could or should you have done? Well, nothing. Are you sure? Yes. Perhaps we need to find a cure for this terrible disease of cognitive dissonance. Let's follow it through to confirm our diagnosis. So, what about this? No. What about that? No. What about repeat offences? I've got an excuse for that. What about patterns of play? No, 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 I, no. I, I'm, I'm sure I've got an answer to that somewhere. I can't think of it, so I'm going to go back to my original argument. What if we have video evidence that we can review? When you're suffering from cognitive dissonance, you forget all the evidence to the contrary and stick to your guns. Even when the weight of that evidence becomes too much to carry, dogmatically, we stick to the original explanation because that's the right thing to do, isn't it? I just wonder whether when he looks back at that on video, he'll actually look at that particular part. And if he does look at that particular part, what he'll think. Now look, we all make mistakes, and a referee with a growth mindset would have thought about the comments and maybe offered some other justification. Imagine if the conversation had changed slightly. There wasn't enough go forward for me to penalise. If there had been, I would certainly have given a yellow card. So now we've got one person's judgment of a, a, a portion of the game on the field, on the movement, but the process was still right. He just has a different judgment. The process was right. The thought processes were right. The end result, if things had been very, very slightly different, would have been the same. So we can sleep soundly. Maybe the referee had realised during the debrief that he'd literally dropped the ball. He was so determined not to lose face that he forced himself to defend his actions at all costs. We can't mock that because we've all done it. To pretend otherwise would simply mean we're a fine example of cognitive dissonance. The key thing here is whether we engage in this type of reasoning, it really is only about fooling ourselves. When evidence makes to the contrary, we have to accept it. We must examine the evidence at the very least and act upon any conclusions to achieve a growth mindset. As we progress as referees, this actually becomes a little bit harder. Those decisions have to be made much more quickly. They take on greater gravitas. Sometimes we're dealing with players and coaches who are getting paid and perhaps their livelihood depends on this next game. Their job might depend on this next game and its outcome. Now don't get me wrong, coaches are much more guilty of cognitive dissonance than we are as referees. We are, however, in good company. It's said that those who suffer from the avoidance of evidence are usually the most intelligent. See? Referees are intelligent. Look at the business world. Archie Norman, current uh, chairman of Marks and Spencer, said this to the shareholders. The business has failed to arrest the underlying drift in competitiveness. The business has been failed for over two decades. They're very interesting words. Underlying drift. The hell is that? What's a drift? Where does it lie and under what? What forces are to blame? Who's to blame? It certainly wasn't him. The business has been failed. Who by? Why? Well, it wasn't him, was it? The business has been failed. Not, I have failed the business. Does that mean people at the helm are incompetent? Well, no, far from it. Mark Bollard was the CEO of Morrison's before he moved to m and in 2010. And before that, he was the Chief Operating Officer from Heineken. And yet, even he couldn't stop a huge decline in the business. Profits falling from 820 million pounds in 2010 to 404 million by 2016. Don't get me wrong, I'd take the 404 anyway. Yeah, that would just serve nicely for my little Caribbean island I've got planned on the great expenses we get paid. Now, Boland had a vision. He had an idea for how the business was to be reshaped. 
It's been all over the TV for decades. That's why he was appointed CEO in a bid to stem the tide of failure. That vision actually proved to be his undoing. Not necessarily because it was a bad idea, but when the results came in, not as predicted. In other words, the evidence was mounting against the direction that they were travelling. He was suffering from cognitive dissonance. He was blinded by the vision that he created. Now, it's easy to prove you're going in the right direction. Things don't come out the way you want them to. But don't worry, it's early days, give it time. Things will change. The market conditions this year have just been against us. It's a long-term strategy. These are all words that he used. We didn't expect the results to be immediate. This is a fixed mindset. Put that in a sporting context. Pep Guardiola was asked in 2017 if his team would win the FA Cup. Sure, he said. No doubt. When he didn't, he was confronted about his uh, comments by a journalist. And he simply responded by saying, yeah, we will win the FA Cup. I just didn't say when. <laughs> when M&S were repeatedly forced to issue profit warnings to the shareholders, it wasn't the vision that was to blame, according to Bolland. It was market forces, taxation, rent rises, and their expansion into the United States. A new strategy was needed. Perhaps this is what we need in refereeing. A new strategy to help us see the picture through other people's eyes. Something to help us. Something that allows us to analyse the evidence presented with an open mind. A mind that can be persuaded should the need arise. We're taught to use strategy in go during games in various situations. The picture isn't what I'm looking for. You're painting a different picture for me. That's not how I saw it. You need to change your behaviour. Strategy is all well and good, but culture eats strategy for breakfast, according to the business and management consultant and educator Peter Drucker. And he's right. It's the culture underlying things that has to change. As referees, we are the sole judge of fact and law on a rugby field. It says so in the book. That in itself leads us down a very short cul-de-sac, one where, guess what? We are right. <coughs> it's not often that we hear a referee apologise to players for an error that they've made. We are, after all, only human, but it is refreshing when it happens. Players, coaches and spectators, look at us on the rugby field, not only as the fountain of all knowledge, but also as a wise old owl. We understand rather than simply knowing. We show empathy to their team. We appreciate their game plan and their strengths. And at the same time, we must penalise the opposition for every single, simple, solitary indiscretion that they make. That pressure for us to be perfect, that pedestal on which we stand, puts us in a very dangerous position in terms of our personality. Our ability to learn and adapt and to change means we have to change our culture. The social norms, the behaviours, beliefs, laws, customs, habits and capabilities. We should accept that we are very unlikely to change the culture of the coaches, the players, and definitely not the spectators. But we can change our culture. We need to change as a whole, as a group of everybody involved in match officiating. This includes not only us as referees or assistant referees, but performance reviewers, observers and referee coaches too. Changing culture within a team, a business or an organisation is extremely complex, but one that is achievable with a growth mindset from everybody. Culture is often inherently ingrained within those who have come before us and fall easily into their ways. For the development of the organisation, this is a dangerous place to be. Even more dangerous are those who seek to halt change or halt progress, for they are suffering their own cognitive dissonance. There's a number of reasons why referees may not be open to our ideas of change that's suggested to them in debriefs, but one clear fundamental is the culture. The underlying and unspoken belief that making a mistake as a referee can halt or destroy your ambition. It's this fear in refereeing that prevents us as a group to grow and to learn through our own mistakes and those of others. 
Remember what question that referee was asked. What could you have done differently? What does that imply to them? If I say to you now, what could you do differently? What is the underlying question? You got it wrong. I didn't do well enough. I didn't do it right. Other questions that elicit this response or similar responses are things like, how can you change things? How can you improve? And what can you do differently? We've all heard these from our performance reviewers and there's nothing wrong with those questions and they're perfectly valid ones. These are all questions that help us to achieve that growth mindset. But they also make us feel bad inside. They make us feel inadequate in a way and they make us feel like we failed to set what we needed to and they put us on a defensive path. And as developers, coaches, mentors, observers, you have to be aware of how the referee is going to feel. Now a number of teams will video their games and they review them with their coaches afterwards. They look at different plays, running lines, opportunities, the ones they've taken, the ones they've missed, the scrums, the lineouts. They've got evidence to show their successes as well as their mistakes and there's no hiding from them. Now players may blame a bad pass, a foot that slipped on wet grass, a player who got in the way. But the great players, those who want to get better and better, will know, at least on the inside, that they made a mistake. Those with a passion to improve will use the expertise of those people around them, the coaches, in our case the developers, the mentors, the observers. They'll look at things with an open mind, they'll inquire, they'll ask questions, and they will accept that they can do better, because they have a growth mindset. Why can't we be the same in refereeing? Take another sporting example, the Mercedes F1 team. They analyse over 2 million data points after each race. Between practice runs, they do, the drivers, the mechanics, the tacticians, all get together to eke out a tenth of a second here or there. To increase the grip in the turns, the downforce on the straights, and the braking efficiency. Their mindset is to learn and grow. And they'll do whatever it takes. They will test ideas, some which are based on science, and some which may be best based on nothing more than intuition. They will keep trying, keep changing, and keep learning. As a referee, to what extent do you evaluate your performance? What are you prepared to do in order to improve and to succeed? And ask yourself this. Do you really, truthfully, and honestly learn from your mistakes? Do you know where your mistakes are? Are you actually ready to make a mistake in order to learn? Are you prepared to try new things? Maybe a bit of positioning that somebody suggested to you, or a, uh, a new running line, or where to go in the scrum. Are you prepared to work that bit harder? How do you react when something's gone wrong? More importantly though, how do you react when somebody points out an error to you? Now look, some match officials are blessed with the ability to examine videos. We've seen some today from Belper, was it? Where's Belper's video? Boston, Boston. Boston video. <coughs> um, others will have data provided by a performance reviewer in the form of notes and a timeline as well as an examination. And hopefully they go through an interpretation of that data with their coach. But how much of that data do you really take on board as a referee? How much do you really listen to everything that's being said so that you can make an informed judgment? Do you nod in the right place? Some of you. Do you feel a bit aggrieved inside when somebody points it out but you still nod anyway? Or do you close your mind because you, they've questioned the decision you made? Do you open up, ask questions about the context of the decision or other options that you may have had? Do you accept there may be a better solution? Was there another way? Do you have a growth mindset? Or are you suffering from cognitive dissonance? Do you put up defences, hide your errors? Or are you quick to blame others? The culture to accept your errors and your failures is a global sentiment in any environment. Failure is something that we have to all endure. Perhaps we didn't do well in a crucial examination, or we underperformed at a job interview. 
Maybe we underperformed on the pitch for whatever reason. But the way we address these failures or errors is crucial to the analysis of the event and our ability to learn from the mistakes and produce a strategy or direction to improve. For match, offici match officiating, that means all of us. Referees, coaches, developers and observers. I've seen too many game reports where the language used just in one small section can, can and often does undermine the whole report. Those who support our match officials must have a fundamental understanding of the growth mindset and the factors that will cause match officials to close up, to become unresponsive and to fail to adapt to new ideas. This is your growth mindset as a developer. A progressive attitude towards failure, therefore, is actually the cornerstone of future success. We must allow errors to openly happen and then discuss them. What are the contributing factors? What's the consequence? What's the challenge? And what options are available to us? We must agree a course of action that will see us improve next time. A culture that accepts failure as a mechanism to success, as a learning tool, will produce success. So let's look at two different examples of culture in two different industries. We'll take aviation and medicine. Aviation has been around for just over 100 years and is one of the highest safety records on the planet. In 2013, there were 36.4 million commercial flights around the globe that carried 3 billion passengers. Only 210 people died that year in commercial aviation accidents. That was one accident for every 2.4 million takeoffs. In 2014, that number fell to the lowest ever on record, one accident for every 8.2 million takeoffs. This is because, as an industry, they have an open set of procedures and reporting protocols that allow and encourage the sharing of data, some of which they can do so anonymously. Things like near-miss reports, incidents that compromise safety, incidents or procedure errors that could have compromised safety, training issues, human performance issues, and design faults. This is called an open loop, one where the acknowledgement and study of errors directly and actively leads to progress. Take for example the B-17 bomber, stalwart of the film industry. In the early years of operational sorties, between 1938 and 1939, there appeared to be a huge number of gear up landings for the B-17, causing significant damage, injury and obviously a considerable cost. After some investigations, the US Army Air Force employed a psychologist try and fix the problem. Not an engineer, not a pilot, not an air crash investigator, but a psychologist. This, fre this fresh set of eyes was able to determine that in the heat of the operational flying, with tiredness of factor, the flight crew were confusing two levers, one for flaps and one for the landing gear. In the cockpit, they're placed side by side on the instrument panel and they were identical both to look at and to touch. Now imagine returning to your base after a nighttime bombing raid over Germany. You're cold, you're tired, you're mentally fatigued, and probably a little bit shot up by then. The airfield is in sight, you reach for the landing gear, you select the wrong lever. You hear the hydraulics moving because the flaps extend. Crunch. The psychologist suggested that as the position of the levers could not be moved without a complete redesign of the systems, maybe, just maybe, the levers should replicate what they actually did. The flat lever was fitted with a curved handle to match the shape of the flats. The undercarriage lever was smith fitted with a small wheel on the end. This lever design exists today in almost every aircraft because it does what it says on the tin. Medicine, on the other hand, has been around a little bit longer than aviation, and yet it suffers massively from an inability to recognize or learn from errors. A 2005 report by the National Audit Office showed that 34,000 people died in the UK as a direct result of human error in hospitals. That's the same as one fully loaded Airbus A380 crashing to the ground every four days. 
The same report said 974,000 people also received non-fatal injuries <coughs> due to human error or institutional failings. Things like misdiagnosis, wrong drugs, post-operative complications, injuries during surgery, operating on the wrong part of the body. Well, I don't go to those hospitals. In other, any other field, that would be completely unacceptable. But in medicine, the culture of denial, or at least not admitting your errors, means that they have failed to learn. In the USA, hospital preventable deaths in 2013 was the third biggest killer behind only heart disease and cancer. Now, as far back as the second century AD, Gallien of Pergamon was using bloodletting as a cure. Now, okay, he also asked you to take an elixir as a cough medicine made out of mercury, but you know, they, these treatments were developed by the medics of the time with their best intentions uh, and not understanding what things actually did. Now, strangely enough, Benjamin Rush was still practicing bloodletting as a cure in 1810 in the UK. And he was renowned for drawing huge amounts of blood, often several times from the same patient. Just at the, when their patient was at the weakest, he was taking all their blood away and he was killing them. Now, he didn't do this because he was a distant relative of Harold Shipman, but because he couldn't see the errors in the procedure. People didn't conduct tests or trials. They didn't examine performance or test theories. These were men of science, but they each learned from the guy who went before them. There was nobody to challenge them. Now, if the patient recovered, it would be put down to the success of the bloodletting. And if the patient died, well, they must have been so ill that even the wonder cure of bloodletting was unable to save them. They never detected failure in their own systems. For almost 1,700 years, the practice of bloodletting continued until clinical trials began as a test of medical procedure. In the 200 years since we've had the, uh, medical testing, we've gone from bloodletting to gene therapy, directly because of a challenge testing and learning from our mistakes. Now that said, medicine in terms of practitioners is still lingering in the closed loop system, where we fail to learn from what we do. Errors or weaknesses often go understood, misunderstood or ignored in hospitals. The open loop in aviation leads to progress. The cold loop, closed loop in medicine often leads to lack of progress. Look at some of the language that doctors use. They often explain things to relatives using closed loop language. There was a complication. It was just one of those things. It was a one off. Nobody could have foreseen the outcome. Health research scholar Nancy Berliger conducted an investigation into how doctors talk about errors. She concluded that students of medicine learn from their mentors and supervisors. They teach them to believe in, practice, and reward the concealment of errors. They learn how to talk about unanticipated outcomes. A mistake morphs into a complication. They learn not to tell the patient anything. She investigated the resistance of doctors to, to disclose and the length that some of them will go to to justify that habit of non-disclosure. Between themselves, doctors often use comments such as, it was a technical error. Things just happen sometimes, and the patient doesn't need to know. There's a profound tendency for evasion within this profession. In fact, investigations into patient deaths are not routine in the UK. There's only a requirement to investigate if there's a legal case brought against the hospital. How can we learn if we don't investigate the errors? Think of those two structures. Think of those two cultures. One in which a disclosure of your errors and the issues affecting safety or performance are encouraged and celebrated, and one where they're not spoken about, they're hidden from view. What is the culture in rugby refereeing in your experience? What do you think the culture in refereeing should be? What do we need to do? What do you need to do to change? What do you need to do to have a growth mindset? to respond to the question, why? And to be an open loop. <coughs>
They're the questions you need to ask yourself between now and the next time somebody comes and sits with you and watches you and evaluates your performance. I hope that's given you a little bit of food for thought, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your attention tonight. Thank you very, very much for all of your input tonight. I look forward to seeing you next month. Take care. Safe journey home. Thank you.